Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Sam's Healing Podcast. If this is the first time that you're joining me, I'd like to welcome you. I hope that you will keep coming back. Today, you're in for a treat. If you've not met Dr. Hedelius before, uh, you will love him. And if you are familiar to the podcast, you have been here for the interviews prior with Dr. Hedelius. So, as always, Dr. Hedelius, thank you for coming in. Why don't you give the newcomers and maybe those that are still getting to know you a little bit more insight about who you are, the Paradise Creek Recovery Center, and what you do. Sure. Thank you, Sam. Yes. Uh, indicated I'm Dr. Matthew Gillies. I'm the director of Paradise Creek Recovery Center. We are located in Southern Idaho. We're an eight bed facility and we specialize in the treatment of problematic sexual behaviors in men. So what that refers to basically is someone who comes to us typically has a significant addiction to pornography, other forms of sexual behavior, whether it's strip clubs, multiple affairs, online offenses. Uh, we also uh, are unique in that we will take people who have gotten in trouble with the law with child sexual abuse images. That's uh, in reference to child pornography, but the appropriate term is child sexual abuse images. And so we see individuals like that every month. Our minimum length of stay is five weeks. And typically during that five to six weeks time, people will get an average of about 12, 18 months of outpatient therapy. A lot of individual therapy, a lot of group therapy, a lot of psychoeducation work, and of course, 12 step work. So uh, if you have any questions, you're welcome to visit our website, give us a call, answer any questions you may have. Fantastic. So today I wanted to launch out with a question that a lot of my clients have been experiencing both younger and midlife, older, like us. And I've actually had some betrayed females asking, what is my partner or spouse, spouse supposed to do? And I was even talking to a couple of clinicians and I told them I was bringing you in to talk about this. And they gave me a few questions and they were so excited to have you speak to it. And that is the topic that we men find to be I'm sure you'll speak more to it, but in, in my um, caseload, we as men find it to be debilitating. We find it to be massively shameful, and that is the topic of erectile dysfunction. And so I figured you were the best one that I could bring in to talk about this in a loving, in a caring, and even a scientific and therapeutic way so that both the men and women can walk away with tools and a greater understanding of why it happens. And so my first question is on a general level, and then I'll let you take it down to more of a meta level. Where does erectile dysfunction come from? Yeah, a great place to start, Sam. So historically, until probably maybe two, two and a half decades ago, the belief was that most erectile dysfunction occurred or originated from psychological issues. And so stress, anxiety, that type of thing. As research has caught up, however, the actual inverse is actually true, that it appears that most of the root causes are uh, physical in nature. And there's a small percentage, 20 to 25, maybe 30 percent, that uh, the root causes are psychological in nature. However, it's not really easy to make that determination just at looking at the patient at you know one at one view. So the first thing that one ought to do as they if they find themselves in a situation where they're experiencing a retinal disorder or dysfunction is to go and have a, a very good in-depth uh, thorough medical workup. Typically, a, a, a family practitioner or urologist would be. Uh, a good candidate for this procedure. They're going to look at things such as blood pressure. They're going to look at and see whether you have diabetes. Is your weight within a uh, appropriate uh, BMI level? They're going to look at are there any medications that you're taking that will inhibit um, erectile functioning? So, for example, many of the SSRIs, what are the antidepressants? They'll have sexual side effects that will inhibit 
both functioning and interest in males and females. Uh, blood pressure medication, if you're on something it's like, for example, a beta blocker to bring blood pressure down, that will impair uh, functioning. And part of the reason we'll talk about it more in a minute is one thing that you need in order to get an erection is you need an increase of adrenaline in your bloodstream. Well, a beta blocker blocks the release of adrenaline. So it's, it's almost like exercising and running and not having enough oxygen to do the job. So all of those factors uh, can be uh, significant issues, uh, swollen prostate, things of that nature. And uh, so you want to get a good check on that. Erectile dysfunction can start in the, in the, in the 20s and can progress generally uh, increases with age. Uh, once someone hits the half century mark, then the, the rate of it goes out. Uh, mm. But but the good a good medical workup is the best place to start. So when we are caring for people in crisis, I was introduced to a term years ago before it was now kind of in the mainstream caring of of unfaithfuls, especially males is porn induced erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Now, someone of your caliber that cares for people in this type of problematic sexual behavior, do you subscribe to that belief? And if so, how, if a guy is, is watching or listening and he could look for signs that maybe he could say, you know, it is, it is becoming difficult for me to either maintain or to have an erection because I need to look at porn to get an erection. Mm -hmm. So I put two questions in one there. Do you subscribe to that? And if so, why, if not, why not? And if so, what are some things that they can do to start to get help with that? Cause that's very common in my world. Yeah. Yeah. That, that that's a great question. Great topic. So, the research on pornography induced erectile disorder is, is thin. There, there is some literature out there. Uh, it's a bit controversial in that there are some studies that say the yes, um, uh, long-term pornography use can induce erectile dysfunction. Uh, there are also some studies that say no, that it can't. This is how I would approach that. Uh, by definition, one of the, uh, criteria for erectile dysfunction neurobiologically is a narrowing and a hardening of the blood vessels in the penile area, which prevents them from enough blood flow getting in the penis to uh, develop and maintain an erection. So that's, that's the, uh, the health care uh, definition of what's going on. Now, the, the causes can be uh, numerous, as, as, we, as we've talked about, in terms of different healthcare issues or psychological. So, with pornography induced erectile dysfunction, there's not necessarily a hardening of the, of, the, of the blood vessels or a narrowing of them. But what the research does show is that because of the tolerance effect of pornography, meaning that it takes more and more of a certain stimuli to get a specific response that does affect sexual interest and sexual desire. So if a male partner is heavily involved in pornography and has a ritual, say once a day, maybe somebody multiple times a day of viewing very hardcore pornography, and many of those occurrences include masturbation to the point of orgasm, if he comes home at night and his spouse or partner desires a sexual and intimate experience, his ability to perform is going to decrease just be, just from a plumbing standpoint. Yeah, there's less totally. testosterone. Uh, yeah, all all of that. So that tends to be what it is that that um, there's a, a decrease in sexual arousal because of the high stimuli that that he's viewing. That makes total sense. You said that extremely well and very palatable. So let me ask you a question and we didn't talk about this off camera to the guy that feels like he, maybe he 
abstains from any type of pornography during the day, comes home, his wife wants to be intimate, and he is not able to get an erection, but will want to look at pornography with his wife, and his wife is okay with it, and kind of feels like, if this is what he needs in order to perform, I'll go along with it. I have found that to be somewhat common in how do they, and I'm going to say this because we're both being super sensitive to the, to the nature of the topic. So to the couple that is living that way, inevitably the betrayed kind of feels like, look, the fact that you need this is starting to make me really uncomfortable and terrified about our future. But the unfaithful is like, I need it. How do you help that couple? What are some things that they can do? And of course, predominantly, what is the man in that scenario? How can he help himself? Yeah, that's, that's another great issue. First of all, I, I think sensitive is a good word because there's a lot of different beliefs, um, social, culture, morally around that issue. So my, my statement would be to practitioners and to clients, patients is proceed with caution when this is part of your, your story. So first of all, we want to be very aware of the tolerance effect and, and, and the tolerance effect again is when it takes more of a certain stimuli to achieve a certain response. So, uh, as people come into my practice, a paradise figure out patient. Typically by that time, most if not all of the medical issues have been ruled out. So we, we know that it is psychological or relational in nature. And uh, if you're if you're eating uh, all of the cakes and candies and whatnot throughout the day, and then you come home at night ready for some a baked potato, uh, per se, it's it's not your appetite's going to be different or, or the palate's going to be different. Not that the potato is not good. It's wonderful, right. but, but neurobiologically your brain goes after the, the, the thing that will release dopamine the quickest. And that is the sugars. So with pornography, the factors that release dopamine, one is the anticipation of novelty. So something that's new. And then the experience of novelty. So, uh, in my clinical opinion, you're really setting yourself up for some challenges if you bring novelty into a relationship uh, with a partner. Now, I know that that in and of itself, that topic is controversial. There's there are many yeah. sex therapists that will say, "Go ahead and do that and whatnot." And and uh, but my my opinion is if we're if the goal is connection and the goal is true intimacy between two people, generally you're going to find disappointment in functioning and connection if you bring that sexual existence material into the relationship, especially into the sexual relationship together. So two things I would recommend. First of all, uh, in terms of pornography induced erectile issues, a 90 day abstinence period from all sexuality tends to be a really good starting point in that that allows you to kind of reset, reset the neurobiology and, uh, get through a lot of that withdrawal so that a normal sexual partner will be adequate, uh, stimulation for you to uh, have that, that sexual experience. That also allows you during that 90 days to focus on really some of the more important issues of intimacy, and that is emotional connection, psychological connection, intellectual connection, that type of thing. So that's, that's the first thing that I would recommend. Generally, that needs to be done under the, the supervision of a therapist or a coach or someone who can help with that because... Right. Uh, we're able to justify and minimize too easily. Say, ah, it's been it's been sixty days. That's long enough. We'll just go ahead and, and really that well. That's not. Yeah, I was already 
going to intervene and go for all the men that just passed out or fell on the floor or just drove their car into a tree because they have to go 90 days. I, I'm so glad that you said that because it is possible. It is absolutely yeah. possible. I have in the past done a, um, I just called it a sex fast mm -hmm. in my own relationship and it was very helpful. It was a challenging but helpful task that I hated the idea of it and but yet it was fantastic. Now it was not 90 days. You're never gonna hear old Sam tell you to do something he hasn't done. It was not 90 days, Doc. Um, I think it was 30 days and it might have even been 28, but we'll just leave it up there. So that's the first thing. So thinking about abstinence, what's another thing that they can do? So the second thing then is to, to have, have an understanding of what's going on neurobiologically when this takes place. So um, in, in our work in, in the area of sexuality, you know, couples are going to come in with some distress. Typically, uh, the spouse and the individual's wife is going to be anxious about, does he find me attractive? Is he viewing? Is he being faithful? And it really only takes one experience of poor erectile functioning for the man then to get anxious. And when that anxiety occurs, functioning is going to decrease. So a normal healthy sexual experience must start out in what we call the parasympathetic state. So the parasympathetic state is the relaxing, soothing, calming state where we can show interest and then we gradually build in uh, tension and arousal as the sympathetic nervous system increases and we get to the top of the curve. And when the, uh, the point of orgasm, that's when the sympathetic nervous system says, okay, uncle's too much stimulation. I give in and you experience orgasm and then you go back down to the parasympathetic state. So the key is, if we're going to have a good sexual experience, let's enter this with uh, very flexible expectations. The primary goal of, of, uh, of connecting physically, emotionally, psychologically, and that can really help to get away some of the performance anxiety, which will automatically leave you in the parasympathetic state to gradually get into the sympathetic. But if you're anxious, if you're arguing, uh, if you sense distrust from your partner, that's going to affect you. And the chances of, of having a good sexual experience is, is, is very low. So Absolutely. if those things are coming up, that's when you go to Sam or some other individual and you work through those things and uh, have that more parasympathetic state when you walk into that sexual experience. And if you find that you're, you're just continuing to have those experiences, the best thing to do is take a break so that you don't condition yourself and teach your body and your nervous system to be in that state every time, because that's a good recipe for disaster. Absolutely. And I, I can think of a few people that just heard you say that and said, thank you for saying that because we just, we just keep repeating those patterns now. So. For the people where it's not physical, and maybe it's trauma, maybe it's childhood sexual abuse, and obviously we don't have the time to cover every single element, right? But for those that are dealing with more of a psychological blockage and struggle to developing an erection or keeping an erection, what are some things that they can do? I mean, you're an expert. You spend so much time with guys who are walking through this. What are some of the most effective ways that either a gentleman listening can go to their own therapist or coach or maybe find somebody else and they can say, hey, I want to do some work with this and or I want to do some work with that. I'm in good health, but I'm still struggling with this. What are some things that they can do? How do you help men who struggle with that type of ED? So, so first of all, um, you, we've got to look at the base of the issues. And if there's trauma, 
which is certainly going to play a, a part in this. You, you've got to get the trauma well on its way to being resolved first. I'm yeah. not going to say that it has to be completely resolved because we never, I don't know if we're ever really there. It's a lifelong nice. process. Yeah. But uh, good, good trauma work. And so maybe some EMDR therapy, uh, some yeah. workshops, uh, maybe even some inpatient work that specializes in trauma. Get those things taken care of first and then start to do some really good relational work where you're mm. seeing a, a coach for relationships or a marriage part marriage therapist and uh, make sure that there there's trust back and forth that there's a good dyadic trust. And in the middle of this process, it doesn't mean that you just you know sleep in separate beds and put a wall between you, but, but learn to start to connect. On a, on a good psychological and emotional level, but learn the power of safe touch, a hug, an embrace, cuddling, the snuggling, and uh, learn to help your nervous system be okay with that. Because if, if there's trauma, the basal, that basal ventricle says the body keeps the score, as you're well aware. So a, a touch on a certain part of the body will induce memories of that trauma, at least physiologically, and you're way up in the sympathetic too fast, and then your functioning is impaired. So learn to uh, experience touch in a safe environment with a safe and trusted partner. And then lastly, on top of that, realize that it's it's not a race, and there, there's not a timetable. It's, it's your timetable. And so slow and gentle generally is the the process to make this effective. So in everything that you've said, the common denominator that I keep hearing you bring out in every question that I've hit you with, and I shoot to it so great because I've hit you with some really hard, deep questions. And I know it's never a one size fits all, but you have used the common denominator at some level of it all being relational with your partner and safety and bringing it into the room, as clinicians would say, or bringing the discussion out into the open. Am, am I wrong or am I onto something that that is absolutely just a common denominator and regardless of, of what type of ED you're dealing with in the treatment of it? Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's absolutely crucial because uh, when you look at the relational model, Many of these individuals who are not able to get and or maintain an erection to the point of orgasm with the partner, they can get with their fall and have absolutely no problem getting an erection. And, yeah, and, and exactly. So that, that, that tells you there is a relational dynamic here. And, and unfortunately, that they trust their phone maybe more than they do their partner. So whatever needs to be done to put that partner back in the number one slot above the fold, above the iPad, the, above the computer. And if if a partner recognizes that she's down the ladder, you know, two or three spots, whether you say it or not, she's gonna know it. And yeah. And that that's gonna impair the dynamic. So yeah, address the relationship uh with, with somebody that you trust. Okay, so a guy can bring the phone into the room and have an erection easily or even with his wife easily but without the phone it's really tough it's really a difficult scenario so at that point then we look no further obviously medical and we've done that but we look at that moment and we say it's very likely that he how would you finish that sentence what are some things that these because i know many are probably going, okay, so you got me. Yeah, the phone, it, I'm, I've got a strong erection, I'm good. Without the phone, uh, no. So what are some things that they could delicately, with a safe third party, because doing this work with your spouse, is she's, she's going to be in this kind of scenario, she's going to be far too reactive and probably going to take a lot of it maybe uber personal. So where does the guy go, or not where, but, so he goes and finds an expert. What does he begin to explore? Is it being afraid? Is it feeling, and this is no disrespect to the female spouses, 
Is he struggling with feeling mommed, feeling controlled? What are, are there some, um, are there some nuances that are, are common, commonalities that they should look for? Yeah. So it, it could be any of those things. So a good therapist, good coach is going to help examine that thing. So let, let's just say, for example, you use the word, is it being mom? Uh, if he feels for one reason or another, that he's in a mother son relationship, that's going to impair his functioning. Uh, rarely do children, males or females, want to have sex with their parent. And so that, that that's one thing you want to literally look at the relationship he has with the phone. You know, so if I, if I have this phone or this, this device here and it's, and I get in bed and I'm finishing up my emails and my text messages, really what I'm doing is I'm bringing a third party into the bedroom with us. And whether or not there's anything sexual or inappropriate going on, um, it, it does cut the other partner out. If, if I'm texting in front of her or email, she doesn't know what I'm doing. And but, so I, I think you have to quarantine the bedroom to the point that we're not allowing anybody else to come in here. So if it's 9 30 or 10 o'clock, the devices go off and, and they just, they just stay off for, for several years. And even today I, I take call. So that may mean a, a phone call overnight, uh, whether it be from a hospital or treatment center. So I have to be available. So I, I put the phone on the nightstand and turn it up loud, but I'm very deliberate to not be looking at any emails or what, because I want to send a message to my spouse that, okay, I'm, I'm here, we're, we're, we're together. So, uh, you know, look at the psychodynamic issues with your partner, then the relational issues with, with the phone. And then a third thing that's fairly concrete in many ways, but yet complex. And that is, is she trusting you? And if there's been some unfaithfulness, have I done a full disclosure? And have I assuaged her questions and anxieties regarding that? And and really, you can't get back to healthy sexual functioning uh, until you've done that full and guided disclosure and and well on your way uh, to, to resolving those issues. Yeah, that was, we could probably take that chunk right there and probably write a couple of different books on, on, I loved what you said, concrete yet complex. And that's verbiage I think I will introduce into my own caseload is that it is, this is a concrete but yet complex issue. And so as we wind down today, I, I feel like one of the best ways for us to end it would be to help so many men who have probably lost hope that it can be resolved and are probably at the end of their rope saying, it's always going to be this way. Maybe you could offer some support or some encouragement to help them understand that from everything that I hear you say, that it is treatable. It is able to be healed. It is able to be worked on that this doesn't have to be this way forever. That's what I come away with. If I'm wrong, please tell me. But you've never said anything that lended an ear towards hopelessness or that this can't be healed. I think as a man, it's this strikes at such a pivotal area that can be so just emasculating, quite mm -hmm. honestly. So maybe take a few final minutes and, and share what you've seen in, in your practice and, and how, unless I'm wrong, and it is very treatable. There is hope, essentially, yeah. right? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. And, and I, I like the paradigm that you work with in terms of that word caring. Those, those who care for betrayed, care for the unfaithful, that's really what this work is about. And I I think I said this on my last uh, meeting with you that, that you know, regular problematic sexual behavior in and of itself is not a life sentence or a death sentence. Uh, same thing with this. It's not a life sentence and it's not a death sentence. Uh, it's, a, it's a certain part of our story. It's a certain part of our journey. And so we have to get through that part of the story and journey. We have to be patient and, 
and gentle with ourselves, uh, patient and gentle with our partner, but believe that that healing and restoration to healthy functioning is possible. Some basic things that can be done. One of the things we know is that exercise helps with this issue. And so get out and get some real vigorous exercise. And research shows that just the beginning of exercise actually increases our body image from a, from a self-esteem standpoint. It generally will increase testosterone levels, both of which are positive things in, in, uh, interest, desire, functioning, and in confidence. So if I have a better body image, even if there's been no change in my body, if I'm exercising, that that's going to help me because I'm going to feel more desired. Um, and, and I may be getting a little bit deep here, but there's, there's three aspects of desire we have to look at. There's sexual desire. That's my desire for a, a partner. That's the, the first leg of a, of a triangle here, desire. It's being desired. So when I'm desired by another person, that increases my arousal. But this third part that often goes met or untalked about is the desire to be desired. So we, we walk around with that throughout the day and we, we have the desire uh, at a neurobiological level to be desired by someone. So as we're doing things that will increase our self-esteem body image, that's going to help with that. Uh, and then I think if you can create a safe place to really talk about the issue, uh, as you, as we opened up, you mentioned this is a, a thing of a, a masculinity that we typically don't want to talk about. So, but, but if I can talk with my wife, my partner about, I'm afraid of not getting an erection. I'm afraid of getting erection and then going soft and not being able to finish. If, if I can talk about that, that shows a great degree of vulnerability. And if she, not to put pressure on her, but if she can accept that, ironically, that increases your confidence. And just, just that acceptance will decrease the chance of you losing your erection and being able to get a, a more, a more firm erection, uh, in that sexual experience. So those are some basic things, uh, but, but really these are things that you can't do by yourself. So you, you've got to consult a professional, uh, who knows what he or she is talking about and someone who believes that problematic sexual behavior is an issue. Uh, if, if, if you're in this field, if you're seeking Sam's help or someone else's help or being betrayed or being unfaithful, you've got to have someone with that working paradigm. Uh, otherwise you may be disappointed in some of the advice that you get. So I love that you just dropped this nuclear bomb when we're about to say goodbye. You say the desire to be desired. Would you say, we're going to have to do another podcast, so I hope you like me because I'm going to have to bring you back in. Would you say part of the reason, but it's different. It's, I mean, it's such a deep question. We know when we get healthy, we're not, you know, actors in, in pornography don't want us. But there is something erotic about seeing two people want each other, right? Even though it's manufactured, even though it's for fun, money, even we we understand that. But you introduced a component that has to play a pretty significant part. So it is the desire to be desired. So if a husband in this scenario doesn't feel desired by his wife, and we're again not trying to put this inordinate amount of pressure on those who are wives who are listening. Please don't hear any message that you're not doing a good enough job or that you're the problem. But is it safe to say if they don't feel desired that that could be another prohibiting factor? Um, absolutely. And uh, not not to drop another bomb, but again, a, a discussion for another podcast. Look at the AI models. You can now get online or, or, or on your Instagram and develop an AI partner. Uh, she's beautiful. She has the, the right shape. She'll talk to you. And it plays into that innate need that we have to 
be desired. And and so again, taking it back to the relational component, that's that's what's got to be discussed there. And and maybe there needs to be some communication on both sides of this is how I communicate my desire to you or for you. How do you communicate it to me? And then what do you need? How do you need me to communicate my desire for you? Very, very powerful, very erotic, and, oh. and very strong factor. Absolutely. I mean, that is erotic, brilliant, and quite honestly, I don't over-exaggerate when I say that could literally be life-changing to couples and individuals. Like, I literally just got chills at that because uh, I'm sure... At the end of the day, that statement, the desire to be desired can be part of fulfillment and eroticism. I think it's brilliantly said. So this just guarantees another podcast with you. So I'm right. thrilled that you <laughs> left, uh, that you just dropped these bombs. So one final time, how can people reach out to you? How can people learn more about your retreat center, how can they connect with you if they want more help or want to maybe even come to um, your treatment center? Yeah, thank you. So you can find me on Instagram under Dr. Matthew Gedilius. You can go to our website, paradisecreekrecovery.com. The easiest way is just to Google that, Paradise Creek Recovery Center. Uh, phone number, 855-442-1912. And uh, we're open 24 hours a day, so we'll be, we can get a hold of you. For those of you that are watching or listening, I'm honored that you would tune in today. I'm sure that you've heard at least a few things that have got your attention. If I can help, reach out to me at samshealingpodcast at gmail.com. Get help somewhere. It can be incredibly isolating to struggle with ED and not know why and maybe have tried a few things or tried a few clinicians or people and have it gone really south. And I just want to tell you, if you find the right people, you can get the right help. And when you get the right help, most of the time you can get the right outcome. And the outcome for all of you is healing. The outcome for all of you is personal restoration. We don't know about your relationship, but we can tell you, if you've got life and breath in your lungs, you have the opportunity for restoration. So thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time because there will be another podcast sometime soon with Dr. Hedelius. Take care. Thank you for joining us.